you know, when most when most Black Americans, African Americans think about Africa as a home, they usually think South Africa and Western African yeah, countries. Africa. Yeah, we rarely choose in that or is in or Kenya, <laughs> right? <laughs> Kenya. Yeah. So it just didn't work for us at the time. It really didn't. It didn't work for us. We weren't comfortable. Um, made great relationships, but it just wasn't the place we wanted to stay. In the year 2019, Ghana introduced the Year of Return initiative. This Year of Return was an initiative to enable African Americans trace their roots uh, to Ghana, to Africa, and to the western parts of the world. As they say, Ghana is the gateway to Africa. But I'm always telling you, if you're an African American, try hard as you can to visit Ghana. You don't have to stay, but visit Ghana See for yourself the slave dungeons. I'm told memories from there are very painful. Uh, it's, it's very hurting. However, many are moving, but not many are staying. They move to Ghana and realize that Ghana is not the country that they want to live in. They realize that it's not what they thought it was. I'm always telling you, do your research. And if possible, uh, make a visit. Always try and make a visit to a place. See for yourself if this is the real deal that you want. Is this where you want to spend the rest of your life? That is what you should do. Because many African Americans are spending a lot of money moving to Africa only to realize that the country they are moving to is not conducive for them, not conducive for their personality. And they end up migrating back to the US or moving back to other African countries. And these reasons may be so many, so many, so many. So an, an African-American sister with his family and husband and children, uh, they moved to Ghana and soon realized that uh, the hype was not there for them. Uh, they, whatever they were seeing in the television was not working for them. And so after living there for some time, they decided to leave Ghana and find another place. So they were moving from one place to another Finding that place that will vibe, finding that place that they'll get the chemistry, that they'll get the full acceptance uh, from the society and themselves. So um, let's dive into this video and uh, listen to what the sister has to say about her experiences uh, traveling from Ghana, what really made her move to Ghana and why she left Ghana looking for other places and eventually what was she looking for in these other countries and uh, what lessons you can learn from her and uh, so that you don't make such mistakes. So without further ado, let's dive in. Let me tell you. Ghana has a very special place in my heart. However, I think I wasn't necessarily prepared for, I wasn't prepared for the infrastructure of Ghana. I wasn't prepared for um, the mindset of, of a lot of the locals there. I wasn't prepared for how the government operated. Um, and so once we, we were there, you know, month passed, two months passed, three months passed, I said, wait, well, okay, hold on now. And, and <laughs> you know how we had to go about doing different things. I think I just, it just was a reality check. And it, you know, nobody can really, nobody prepare can, you. can prepare yeah, you for repatriation. You can, people can give you all of this information until you are in the thick of things. It just, it, it, you have to experience it for yourself. And mm, a few countries that we want to travel to, and we're going to go check them out and see how this works out for us. What, which country do we think we can call home and be comfortable? And so we set out on an Africa trek. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hold on one second. So, yep. Yeah, so we decided to uh, travel to the countries that we had put on our list. We were going to stay there no less than 30 days. Um, a piece we were going to look into what residency looked like there, you know, all the immigration requirements, um, what were the requirements to establish a business as a foreigner, like we really did some real homework on those countries. Um, and we set out on that journey. And it was wild. <laughs> no. So let's can you can can you take us briefly down the road, you you left Ghana, and you mm -hmm. decided to go where where did you go now? So after Ghana, we, we did a little stop in Togo, um, and that wasn't necessarily somewhere we wanted to stay, but we happened to have a friend who had a friend there. So it was kind of on our way to 
um, Cote d'Ivoire. So Ivory Coast was our next major stop. Um, now, once we got to Ivory Coast, we realized the language barrier was gonna be somewhat tough to uh, work around. And I'm, to be honest with you, we didn't really like how, this might rub some people the wrong way, but we didn't really like how Cote d'Ivoire was very uh, European. Yeah, Cote d'Ivoire, we, when we got there, um, we knew that it was heavily, heavily French influence, but we didn't realize how much, how much. <laughs> um, so it, it felt- you, it, wasn't, you wasn't feeling that. No, because it, it felt like what we had just left, only that, you know, everybody was speaking French. Um, so we stayed there again, made great, great connections. Uh, but from there, we left there and we headed to Senegal. Now, Senegal was great. Senegal is beautiful. However, Senegal is also very Muslim. <laughs> so there was, okay, look, and this is the things you got to take into consideration, right? Yeah. Language barriers, religion, all of those things, and you're not going to know until you get there. Exactly. So, that was, and we were in um, uh, Dakar. And so even though Dakar is, is, is being built up or at that time it was being built up, it was, it had this still like old world feel to it too. Yeah. So that was another thing. And again, heavily French influence, right? So they're either speaking whatever their mother tongue is or French, mostly French. Mm -hmm. um, so that it was hard to kind of maneuver around there as well. So that was gonna work. Left there, <laughs> left there, we went to Cape Verde. Oh God. Okay, so again, y'all, language, even though you're like, they're speaking whatever their language is that they're speaking, maybe a form of uh, Creole or Portuguese, whatever colonizer language was left, was left behind. In my mind, I'm thinking, but somebody gotta know English, right? Or that English has to be one of the main languages. That's not. That's not necessarily true. Um, so that made it very difficult, especially when it came to doing business or trying to do business. Did not work, y'all. So Cape Verde, Morocco. Well, Morocco was kind of one of those, like, we could do Morocco. However, being in Morocco is like, you ain't even in Africa no more sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Northern Africa on a whole nother tip. Absolutely beautiful. People treated us like royalty, but very Arabic influence, Middle Eastern, like it feels like you have left the continent. Yeah, um, so you felt more, it felt more like you was in the Middle East. Yes. But oh, Northern Africa? Yeah, Northern Africa, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know one thing that I can say that bothered me a lot about being in Morocco? So there were a lot of continental Africans in Morocco from mostly Western African countries. So a lot of Senegalese, a lot of Gambians, a lot, and they, a lot of them are up there for work. Being in the same space, I did not like the way we were treated in comparison to them. The natives or the locals treated con uh, continental Africans from other, from other African countries like trash. Wow. And although we are all black at the end of the day, right. in their eyes, we're black American. Really, we were just American. Yeah, and being American and having that blue passport, all of a sudden we had privilege that we had never had before. Yeah, so it actually made us kind of uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, so like to be sitting at a table with some guys from Senegal and they come straight up to us, ask us what they want, look at them and just walk off. And I'm like, hold on, but, but yeah, like stuff like that. And it would be little things, but they made it very, very clear we don't deal with them. Yeah. Um, so that was uncomfortable. Well, that wasn't gonna work. That was gonna work. Then we took it over West Africa. We was like, we love y'all. Okay, we gonna try East Africa. <laughs> I'm just saying. So we went to Egypt. <clears throat> Egypt, I think, was more so not necessarily somewhere we were like, we could stay here, but it was somewhere we needed to go. We wanted to go and experience. I can actually say Egypt is a place that is doable. However, also heavily, heavily Middle Eastern-ish feel. Um, but when we met, uh, the Egyptians that were from Southern Egypt, so Ashwan or what most people know as Nubia, 
it was a totally different experience. They was like, y'all are the original people. Yeah, we were- yeah. And that was the first time where I can say that I actually felt like, hmm. Okay, all right. Because East Africa was never like really on my radar. You know, when most, when most b- Black Americans, African Americans think about Africa as a home, they usually think South Africa and Western African countries. Africa. Yeah. We rarely choose in that or is in or Kenya. <laughs> right. <laughs> Kenya. <Yeah. laughs> so you don't really think about that, but hearing, you know, a lot of them talk about like, hey, you know, su- think about southern su- southern Egypt or Sudan or places like that was not on my radar. I'm like, man, this okay. Um, so there was that. However, they had a lot of conflict going on. So that was another thing. Yeah. You don't think about civil unrest. You gotta, you gotta think about these things. So left Egypt, went to Ethiopia. Now, I can actually say, I, I, Ethiopia is somewhere I think I could probably live. I felt extremely comfortable. There was a sense of ease. What I loved about Ethiopia is I didn't feel a presence of any other culture besides Ethiopia. Besides Ethiopia, yeah. There was no, you couldn't see, find a trace of nobody. And I was like, man, this is so dope. The fact that they were, have even been able to hold on to that for so long just made me feel really comfortable. However, Ethiopians really don't fool with nobody else but Ethiopians. Okay. And that's okay. how they've been able to, in my opinion, kind of keep, keep, that, keep it tight. Yeah, yeah, very particular about who comes and sets up businesses. You know, they've now, you can't adopt children from there no more. Like they real... Listen, yeah. okay. Yeah. Rightfully so, so. As they should be. I respect that. So Ethiopia was definitely beautiful. Ethiopia is, is still on my radar. Um, and after Ethiopia, we went down to Rwanda. Now, Rwanda was the place that we said we we could do this long term. Um, I actually have a full-blown business still existing in, in, in Rwanda as we speak in Kigali. Um, the ease of everything down to setting up a business the amount of women that they have in governments, the cleanliness of that country. Um, I'm talking just just on point. However, However, there is this slight undertone of we ain't forgot the genocide. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not laughing, but I'm serious. Yeah. Really? Um, you feel it? It's heavy. It's only been 20 years. Yeah, and for me, as an empath, somebody who feels energy very, very heavy, there's a heaviness in Rwanda like I ain't never felt in my life. Probably outside of being on a plantation, that's what it felt like. Wow. Um, It feels, to me, it kind of felt like like death in the air. Wow. Yeah, so... But it hasn't been so long, so that's not surprising. It hasn't, hasn't. and just how they had to implement certain... things um like their current president you know he's like listen you can't say that you're a Hutu or a Tutsi anymore you're just Rwandese yeah you can't talk about those things and I mean for people who are very tribal to not be able to you know vocalize that I'm sure that that's unsettling yeah so you know that was a little rough but so by the time we got to Rwanda we was like you know what we might just not be ready for Africa not that Africa's not ready for us according to the laws of human nature if you are not ready for anything if you don't like anything you'll always find problems with it and this is what I think is happening to the sister and his family she just left USA unprepared I think she never did her research really good because she said that she went to Rwanda in Rwanda, she found out that uh, she just found out after moving to Rwanda that they experienced the genocide. The genocide is something that she could have known uh, while uh, while still at the United States. Because of genocide, she did not uh, stay in Rwanda. And in Ghana, she said that she didn't uh, vibe in really well. Uh, it's supposedly because I'll say it for what it is. It's supposedly because. Ghana is a third world country just like any other African country, uh, like my country also, which is third world country. Uh, she didn't like the infrastructure. She came with that, um, that perception from US. Uh, we are very developed. We have the best infrastructure. So when I go anywhere, this is what I expect. This is what I want. 
she never did her research. She never knew that Ghana was a third world country. And that's something that she could have really, really prevented just by doing a Google search. Yeah, she could have started by doing a Google search, making phone calls, uh, having connection, speaking to those people who have made it to the countries that she wants to go. In Morocco, she says that uh, it was so much Arabic. Even in the map, we know that uh, Morocco was colonized by the French. Um, and it's some it's it's in the northern regions of Africa in, and in the desert. The Arabs really love living in the deserts. So this is something that even a child knows that in Morocco will find some Arabs. To it should not be a surprise to her that in Morocco we have Arabs. It should not be a surprise. She should have that mentality. I'm going to do this and be ready to, to do that. She just wasn't ready and she just wasn't prepared. Sister wasn't prepared, you know? So she came also all the way up to Egypt. At the north of Egypt, that's obvious. Any south of Egypt is bordering Sudan. Sudan, we have those, uh, the tribe we call the Nubians, the Nubis. We call them the Nubis here in uh, Kenya. So it's true, southern, uh, northern Sudan, uh, southern Egypt, we have these black people uh, who are called the Nubians, you know? She was surprised to find the black people. Yeah. Why was she surprised? It's something that she should have uh, expected. This is not something that should surprise you. If I go to USA, I expect this and that. I expect to see uh, the Statue of Liberty. I expect to see Washington DC. I expect to see this and that. So I'm not hit off guard. Sister was, wasn't ready, ready at all. Uh, moving to East Africa, she found out that uh, this and that, South Africa also, uh, she said it's so, it has a lot of uh, California vibe, which is something that a lot of white, white people like. Uh, that one I might understand, uh, where white people are going, so many of them, because you are coming from, there are so many white people, you don't want to go back again where there's white people, so you want to go where there's black people. But again in South Africa, the larger population is black. Sister just wasn't ready for this journey, and um, I, uh, I know that she's learned, she's learned something that Africa, this is what to expect, and I believe that this, uh, the journey of this sister is able to enlighten you, is able to tell you of the things you need to do, of the things you need to expect when moving to the continent. You will be caught by surprise if you are not prepared. So. Here we make sure that we give you a virtual journey, uh, a virtual tour, a virtual journey, yes, of the continent so that when you come here, you know what to expect. We even go to the streets to bring you videos uh, so that you know what the locals think of you black Americans. Yeah, so um, that's all about the video. Um, I've explained what needs to be heard. I've told you, you have to expect your expectation comes as a result of research, do research, and also um, before you visit a country that you want to live, before you say you want to live in an African country, do your research. If possible, come and uh, have a trip uh, to the country, uh, to a country and see for yourself, is this somewhere I really want to, to be in? Because I remember she said something about uh, Southern Egypt. Southern Egypt... Uh, she said there was some civil war. Sudan is a place of civil wars. So southern Sudan, northern Sudan and southern Egypt, uh, these places are borders. So uh, it's so easy for this thing to, to, uh, to move to the other side because tribes in southern Sudan have migrated to. Uh, tribes in southern Egypt have migrated to southern Sudan. So when there's civil war, it affects southern Egypt and northern Sudan and this is something she should have known these are things that are always there in the news she never did the research she just uh, jumped on the wagon ready to leave so um, thank you for watching the video and um, see you in the next one do subscribe to the channel I will so much appreciate